Merci, Tom. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, um, welcome everybody. I um, appreciate uh, appreciate you coming and um, being willing to uh, uh, chat about sponsorship. And hopefully, we can we can learn a little bit about each other. I wanted to start off with um, a second um, with just a quick agenda. We will go around and do some introductions. Talk a little bit about the the panel and or the talk a little bit about the um, the workshop and and then we will kind of get into the meat of it with our with our panel and then wrap up. So so let's go ahead and um, go around and I'll start um, and let's introduce ourselves and share um, why are you here today and what are you hoping to get out of the workshop and it's perfectly fine to say because I was asked to be on the panel. <laughs> So uh, my name is Mark, and I am the third legacy chair here at um, Intergroup. And part of the third legacy committee's um, role is to try and put on events occasionally, um, and we try and do a quarterly sponsorship workshop. And so that's that's why I'm that is uh, why I'm here, and I'm also here because um, I'm hoping to learn about. Um, kind of the nuances of sponsoring, sponsoring folks who are duly addicted. Um, and so what to, what to know, that's not part of my personal story. So um, I'm hoping to, to learn about the gotchas and other things. So that's me. Why don't I, why don't I. Hi everybody. I'm Sally and um, I'm an alcoholic. And I was invited here by Lara and I was taught for the most part, not to say no to an AA request. doesn't mean you can't, but for the most part, I try not to. So I'm happy to be here to share my experience, strength and hope around sponsoring and um, sponsorship in general and sponsoring people with more than just alcoholism. No, oh, thanks. Good morning. My name is Charlie Kate. Um, I sobered up in Alaska in 1989. I have a sponsor. Um, I'm interested in sponsorship and uh, program of Alcoholics Anonymous and any changes that might be happening. So I'm just glad to be here and glad to be a part of. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Swanson. And I am a recovered alcoholic and I'm here today because I was asked to participate. And the second question up on the board is, what are you hoping to get out of the workshop? I'm actually not hoping to so much get something out of the workshop as I hope that through my experience, I can bring something positive to this workshop. So that awesome. is why I'm here today. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so, program, program. <laughs> so how about um, we start on Zoom with, uh, with Lara? Hey, um, my name is Lara. I'm an alcoholic, and um, I, am, uh, I am here today because I'm passionate about sponsorship in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I'm hoping to learn something out of, uh, about sponsorship, how to be a more effective sponsor. Um, and possibly share some experience, strength, and hope if that uh, seems necessary or is needed. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Rick. Well, all righty then. My name's Rick. I'm an alcoholic. And what am I? Okay. Um, I'm, as you could probably see, I'm an old uh, um, 70s alcoholic, but I didn't. Uh, the whole. Uh, I guess technically I was duly addicted because um, I like food and I like pot. So, um, but what's what's facing me now is this: uh, the people that are that are have been putting themselves in my life are they 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 have they've had problems with with the heavy stuff, and I really haven't. So my my concern is that I don't have that I won't have the ability to 
to uh, identify. That's mm-hmm. that's probably my biggest challenge because I, you know, I, I haven't done it fentanyl. I've never done any of that stuff. My my thought is that okay, it's uh, do they want to do they want to stop drinking? So um, I'm trying to uh, nuanced is is a very good word that I heard Mark say earlier that. Um, <sighs> How do I how do I go into this? I, I don't want to come off like one of those uh, the air quotes around it, pure alcoholic. Yet I I have a very strong um, the singleness of purpose is very important to me, and um, I want I I'm thinking that that's that's kind of got out of rule my uh, my decisions. Um, for for example, a, a fella got a hold of me a while back, and uh, we we're actually doing some reading together. Um, and I don't know that I could sponsor him necessarily. And he has had a bit of a drinking problem before, but this he's coming off of the the other stuff. And I spoke with a friend of mine in NA, and he said, "Well, does the guy want to recover?" Which put me in a position of saying, "Well." <laughs> If I'm going to be of service, I how much can I help? And so, I, in order to maximize whatever I can bring bring to the still suffering alcoholic, that's why I'm here. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Rick. Um, let's go to Abby. Oh, and by the way, if anyone just is here and just wants to listen, just go ahead and say that, and um, and I, I won't call on you, but. Um, uh, that that is fine, Abby. Hi, I'm Abby. I'm an alcoholic, and I'm so happy and excited to be here. Um, I was asked by my sponsor, who is also here, to uh, sign up for the panel. And oh, hey, Dan. <laughs> um, but I uh, so I have experience being a duly addicted person. I have experience, you know, in AA and um, some other 12-step programs. And I have some experience sponsoring people who also struggle with other addictions. Um, But yeah, I also, I I, want to learn how to be a better sponsor for those who are duly addicted. Um, I want to, you know, talk about and hear your stories on how to, like, you know, better maintain our singleness of purpose, our traditions, you know, sticking to our traditions. Um, I'm excited, you know, being on this panel, I've got a bunch of pamphlets and I've like read through them and I'm like, oh, (laughs) like there's some helpful, you know, there's a lot more information than maybe was just in the big book and the 12 and 12 and stuff. So excited to talk about maybe those other pamphlets um, that can help us, you know, be better sponsors while still maintaining, you know, the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm more excited to just listen to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Janet? Good morning, everybody. Janet, alcoholic addict. So I am definitely duly addicted. Um, Yeah, um, that's been part of my story. And when I share my story, I let people know that. Uh, To me, a drug is a drug is a drug. And but this program, Alcoholics Anonymous, did save my life. Um, So I'm here today because I'm passionate about sponsorship I have sponsored many people, women that are duly addicted. One of those sponsees passed away recently. And that was a huge, um, I, I, it just really, really consumed me for a long time. And what, I, what I've done in sponsorship, I just want to learn more from people that have gone through this longer and you know have dedicated themselves to helping um i'm i am also very um i'm just 
you know, I, I am a firm believer in I get to learn something new every day. And that's and so the reason why, you know, I wanted to be on this is not only because I'm duly addicted, because there are so many other people, as Rick was saying, the things have really accelerated and there's lots of new women coming in. And I want to be able to help if I can. I want to be able to to share that experience. So I'm really, really grateful to be here. I'm so happy we have such a lot of people. And thank you so much, Mark, for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you, Janet. Um Let's see, uh, Shannon. Hi, my name is Shannon. I'm an alcoholic. And um, yeah, so one is I'm not a member of the panel, just joining the meeting, um, though I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, the reason why I'm here is because my sponsor, um, Sally, is on the panel. Um, also, I'm very interested in hearing um, others experience strength and hope around duly uh, addicted, because I do have some sponsees um, that are duly addicted, and I have um, several friends in the program that are duly addicted. And then also anything to um, that I can gain on um, sponsorship, right? Um, so that's the reason why I'm here. I'm glad to see others are joining. Um, you know, at least by Zoom. So that's it. Hi, Sally. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Dan, gee. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, I sponsor people and uh, most of them have more than one problem. Uh, and so I have my own um, ideas about what to do, but I'm, I'm open to hearing um, what other people think. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Laura? Yes, hi, I'm Laura and I'm an alcoholic. Hello. And I'm here because I would like to get some ideas on how to be a more effective sponsor and also provide better support to duly addicted. I know a number of people, myself included, and um, I just, I'd like to learn more. So thank you, thank you for having this. Wonderful. And um, Alex. I'm Alex, I'm an alcoholic. Alex. Um, so, so I guess I'm here today because, well, I've been sober for a little over two years and I haven't sponsored anyone yet. And I am, I'm interested in, in beginning to do that. Um, having been in rehab myself, I, I've met so many people that are not only addicted to alcohol, but they're, other, they're addicted to other substances as well. And, you know, even other behaviors. Um, but so I'm I'm looking to understand one how to be a sponsor like a good sponsor <laughs> and work with people that have multiple addictions. Um, you know, at meetings we all so many of our newcomers. It, it, I feel like in some cases they spend more time talking about their addictions to substances primarily over just alcohol. Um, so yeah, so I'd like to be able to help these people. It's it's my time to do more service than just being a secretary or a coffee maker. <laughs> so, so I'm excited about it. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for sharing. I think I got everybody. Did I, if I missed anyone speak up, but I think I got everybody. A um, couple of real brief announcements from um, the third legacy committee. Uh, we put on a tradition study the fourth Tuesday of the month at, at 7 p.m., which is at Intergroup and Hybrid. The Intergroup board meeting is the third Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. And then quarterly workshops on Saturdays at 10 a.m. And those are the, those are the, uh, some of the things that we do. Um, so. And if you're interested in being part of the third legacy. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah. December 7th, we are hosting a speed dating event if you're interested in being a part of uh, the third legacy committee. Um, so I am, it, for the sake of time, actually going to pop over this, this section because I want to dive kind of right into um, right into the, uh, the, the panel. Um, uh, the the folks on the panel today. Let's see. We have we have uh, Janet, Sally, um, David, 
and Abby. And so I've prepared a kind of a list of questions and we'll, we'll go through those questions and, um, and, and if you um, aren't on the panel, that does not mean you're only here to listen. So I, I would encourage you to, to raise your hand on, on Zoom using the raise hand feature. If you're on Zoom, if you have a question and I will call on you after someone's, after a panelist is done sharing. Um, or if you're here in the, in the room, just yeah, raise your hand. But we definitely want this to be, to be pretty interactive and not just, um, not just the panel speaking to you. I know I have questions and, and we'll ask, and it's 100% and it's fine to uh, ask a panelist a question or a clarifying point, that's totally, that is totally okay. We, it's not such a large group that we can't keep this pretty, um, pretty casual and interactive. So, um, so don't um, feel free to feel free to chime in. So uh, I am going to swap the order of my questions a little bit, um, just seemed indicated. Um, and I wanted to start, I wanted to start here. Uh, and so this is kind of one of the key things when we talk about sponsoring the duly addicted. And I would love, I would love to talk a little bit about singleness, singleness of purpose, just to frame the conversation. Um, and so uh, if any of the panelists want to, does somebody feel ready to go and interested in, in talking, otherwise I will just call on somebody. Me? Sure, sure. Okay. David, let's have David start us off with singleness of purpose. All right. Uh, what is it? What, David, why is it important? David Swanson, a uh, recovered alcoholic. Okay, singleness David. and purpose. Uh, and, well, in my experience, getting sober with um, sponsorship lineage that works steps with founders, the purists and Alcoholics Anonymous in the Los Angeles area, this is a very strong topic. However, I do my recovery in Seattle where this is found to be more oftentimes than not uh, overrun by the traditions that all groups are autonomous except how they affect AA as a whole. So I think in being welcoming, uh, in my experience across the board, it depends on which one of my groups during the week you show up to and how we demonst demonstrate this. Uh, we have a book study where we work straight out of the book and, you know, we get into some of the history of what they were doing at certain times and when certain chapters were written in the book. And that's really helpful to new people coming in, um, you know, that are just showing up and they're participating. They really don't know what's going on yet. They might still be in treatment or fresh out of treatment. And this is kind of a pretty advanced question, um, you know, down the road, um, because where they identify really it pertains, you know, just this is my opinion. Now we're going to talk about Dave's Anonymous, not Alcoholics Anonymous. In my opinion, this pertains to who you're going to sponsor and how you're going to identify with them specifically. And something they showed me in Los Angeles the whole way through, uh, Lara and I were talking a little bit a couple of minutes ago. She knew uh, my original sponsor and he demonstrated what we were to be doing and the direction we got was you know crisp clean and you know be on the corner at five o'clock and get in the car and that's all the information we ever got so um they were all purists you'd be shot for mentioning anything outside of alcohol at some of those meetings in los angeles however there's always one or two crusties in there that would be you know would point out that you know dr bob had a history with sedatives and um and, uh, you know, so that that's just my experience with it. Um, my experience, you know, floating, you know, last month I was on the road. So I spent was back at that group in Los Angeles. I was back with some of those people in Las Vegas. And, um, you know, and it's, um, you know, this is, um, this is a topic that just in my experience is kind of held in different, you know, different regard based on what group you're going to you know and that could be regionally or that could just be you know across the town so that's what i've got thanks thank you david thanks. um uh sally you wanna... sure. hi everybody sally alcoholic 
Um, I just want to say my uh, sobriety date is April 30th, 1984. I have a home group, I have a sponsor, and I have a service commitment. All of those things are very important to my sobriety, and I try to keep them all intact and have for the last 40 years. Um, speaking to this question, uh, anybody that knows me knows that I'm really a mad dog about our traditions. Um, unfortunately, they do not get studied enough. And um, so singleness of purpose is really, really important. One of the things that I do when I get a new sponsee, the first thing I do before we even open the big book is go through the traditions. Because without the traditions, we don't get to keep our meetings intact. And so um, I don't spend a lot of time on them until I get to the fifth tradition, which is what this one is speaking to. Um, you know, I, w when I get a sponsee and they're an alcoholic addict, they no longer get to be an addict when they're in Alcoholics Anonymous because addicts have their own 12 step program. And I believe that it's like saying I'm an alcoholic and an overeater or I'm an alcoholic and they, they also have their own 12 step program or I'm an alcoholic and I'm a gambler, which also has their own 12 step program. So our singleness of purpose means we have one purpose that we speak to, which is alcoholism and recovery from it. And, you know, I can't change all of AA. And I know that treatment centers um, inundate the new person with a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous. So I can, uh, I, I can instill into the girls that I work with and close friends that when we are in Alcoholics Anonymous, we are only, only singleness of purpose. We are only alcoholics. Um, you know, there is a big difference between alcoholism and drug addiction in that alcoholism, once we take the drink, the craving has already started. When we take a drug, which I'm also duly addicted. I mean, my drug of choice was just more of whatever. And um, when we take a drug, that craving doesn't happen until we start to come down, then we're on the hunt for that stuff. And so there is a difference. And I just want to share, you know, years ago, I was in a meeting with this um, little lady, Mert, and uh, Mert has since passed. And she got sober when she was about 60-ish, in her 60s. And um, I was sitting in a AA meeting with her one time and this person was talking about his drug use and he didn't mention alcoholism and he was talking about eight balls and smoking weed and you know this little lady was dying literally dying of alcoholism and she came up to me after the meeting and asked me why this person was talking about shooting pool because he was talking about eight balls and um, that's a drug term that has no place in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so if you are a purist, um, as he was talking about, and you're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous to save your life from drinking excessive alcohol, and you hear all this drug talk, um, you, it's confusing. And um, it can lead people to leave our meetings because they don't understand what we're talking about. So singleness of purpose is really, really important that we are only alcoholics when we're in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and we only talk about our alcoholism. For me, when I share, I talk about my alcoholism, even though I'm also a drug addict and um, I, I just don't bring that to the tables in an AA meeting because it's very, very inappropriate. So that's my spiel for now, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Sally. Um, that is, a, that was a, just as an aside, I had, you know, I had heard singleness of purpose is important, but the, but the thought of, Hey, the newcomer getting confused, that's really, you know, that's, that's really helpful to kind of think about it. It's like, okay, Hey, you got it. You have to keep your meetings about what we're here for. Otherwise it confuses people. And these, these are folks who are, you know, dying literally um yeah absolutely Claire. my name is larry i'm an alcoholic hey, larry. um just briefly my experience when i was taken through the through the steps in a, a certain way uh through the book it was pointed out to me that it was very important that i figure out what i'm powerless over i'm not powerless over everything um just because i am a drug addict and i am an alcoholic but just because i'm a drug addict doesn't mean i'm powerless over all drugs there's a number of drugs that I tried that weren't appealing to me. 
Um, and uh, um, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't fall into the camp of a drug is a drug is a drug because that's not my experience. Um, and my alcoholism uh, operated differently within me than my drug addiction. Um, so it was important, it was pointed out to me that it's important to understand what I'm powerless over so mm. that I know who I can help. I am not sponsoring heroin addicts. I'm not a heroin addict. Uh, I'm not sponsoring sponsoring people recovering from meth addiction because I, I don't have any experience with that. I think it's essential for me to know what I'm powerless over, what my experience is, because that's the thing that differentiates Alcoholics Anonymous from any other 12-step program is our first step and what we're powerless over. That's the only difference. And that is the thing that saved Dr. Bob when Bill W. came to speak to him is that nobody could talk to him up to that point about what was wrong with him. Um, and it was only the, through the identification of one alcoholic working with the other, with another, that we all stand here today. And so singleness of purpose is vital to the future of Alcoholics Anonymous, mm. not just the history. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Abby, do you have anything you want to want to share on this? Yeah, sure. Thank you, um, Abby, alcoholic. And thank you, everyone, for your insight so far. Um, my experience is that I was taught you know, when I'm in an AA meeting, I identify as an alcoholic. When I'm in an NA meeting, I identify as an addict. Um, and that that was very important. And I didn't know, you know, why at first, <laughs> but I just said, okay, <laughs> you know, yes, okay. I, um, so learn, you know, little by slow, you know, learning more about our traditions, our primary purpose, you know, to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Um, tradition 10, you know, no opinion on outside issues. So I guess what I'm thinking, this is how I share in meetings, um, the singleness of purpose, because who, I don't know everyone who's there, who's listening, you know, but I will just say like on it, there's probably another question coming up, but on an individual level with my sponsees or other women or fellows in the program, I can share whatever I want. You know, I can share my experience, strength and hope with my history of drug addiction, um, out, you know, outside all the, out, you know, outside issues as this is my opinion this is my experience this is not like alcoholics anonymous this is not the big book this is not you know um and in my experience i guess through working the 12 steps uh in alcoholics anonymous you know my sponsor said let's just let's just do this first let's just work on your alcohol problem your alcoholism first and then we'll see what happens you know and my you know i did go to um another 12 step program too to ident you know identify the addict and i appreciate the literature in those other 12 step programs as well but in my experience you know this alcoholics anonymous has greatly helped me with those other addictions um yeah so singleness of purpose i identify as an alcoholic in the aa meeting you know if an addict at an na meeting that that's just super that is important. I don't know if that's helpful, but I think Janet has her hand, had her hand raised. I want to hear from Janet. Janet. Oh boy, this is tough for me. I Janet alcoholic, so I'm gonna. I'm learning today. Um, I've always introduced myself as an alcoholic addict because it's my reminder to me that alcohol was my drug of choice. It is my drug of choice. But to, for me, when I drank, I craved and I wanted drugs. And so I have tried the other program, the NA program. I mean, I did it for about a year and it just, I, 
I, I couldn't do it. Okay. So I've always been able to get what I need in, in the Alcoholics Anonymous rooms. And the thing about it that for me, when I'm sharing, do I go into detail about crack cocaine? Oh my gosh, no. I say dry goods or I say other substances. I don't go in. But when I go to the jail to share, because I've been going for 10 years, they look at me and they say, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm an addict. And so I tell them I am too. And so then I know that the sharing of that part of my story is going to help them because they're going to know what I did and what I'm doing now, what's different, what I've done. So what everybody has said has helped me so much. Singleness of purpose is what I wrote down is to focus on the core issue my core issue is alcoholism to avoid distractions because do I love to shop? Yeah. Do I eat sweets and drink caffeine? Yeah. Does the program help me with those things? Yes. But to avoid those things, unity within the group, um, accessibility to all alcoholics and well being, welcoming people from all walks of life. Um, the backgrounds and the experiences, because the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. And so, um, yes, I, I've learned today. And so this is the situation, depending on where I am. When I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am going to introduce myself and identify myself as an alcoholic and, and, you know, I have one sponsee that didn't have the substance abuse, and I have another one that is exactly, we've gone through the same thing, so we have helped each other, okay? And then I teaching and practicing the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I am, you know, almost 14 years sober, and I have a sponsor who has a sponsor, and she is very, very much into the traditions as well. And we've done tradition uh, studies. We've also done a study on the sponsorship pamphlet. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to keep it if I wasn't working with other ladies. Like I said, I learned from them. But anyway, it, this it, my heart is beating because, you know, I appreciate everything that everybody's saying. And I, that's why I'm here is so that I can learn. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, I guess I want to dig into that that point there just a little bit more since we have expertise in the room. Like being a little bit new, I I think like for me at least in my mind, there's a difference between introducing yourself as an alcoholic addict, but then focusing on alcohol when you're talking in a meeting, and um, and versus hey going on a tirade about your drug use in a meeting is there some i'm just pushing back a little is there some benefit to introducing yourself that way because it's so common among people in the rooms who that are duly addicted who would who would identify positively i just want to like for those of you who have more experience what are, what are your thoughts and at this very well like by default my sponsor is always like say well what is what does the boss say? What does God say? So like this could be, this very well could be a, Hey, what's indicated? What is your heart? What is, what does your higher power say? Feels like that could very well be where we end up, but I would love to hear if there's some benefit just, just when, when kind of fishing for, for sponsees, for, for people to, even if you don't talk about it, for them to know that that's in a very brief way, part of your experience. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah. All right, David Swanson. A uh, quick reminder, there was a historic time that we did not introduce ourselves as alcoholics. Um, hi, this is Shannon, alcoholic. I was trying to figure out, I'm on um, remote, obviously Zoom, but I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. So is that okay? Did I just jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Shannon, alcoholic. Um, 
Yeah. And so when I first came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, my sponsor, you know, did the first step and, you know, had to write it all out. And then she was like, oh, by the way, you're addicted to drugs. Right. You know, Um, but again, I was just really taught, you know, through the traditions and also the importance of singleness of purpose. So for me, when I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, meaning it's an AA meeting, right? And the the only requirement is the desire to stop drinking. It's really important for me to identify only as an alcoholic. And I do that to one, tell myself, remind myself, obviously I'm an alcoholic, but also for folks that are sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous in those meetings, identifying, hopefully putting that out and they can identify with that. Now, with that being said, you know, behind the scenes, when I was doing my steps, you know, in my first go around, you know, I was going to any and every single meeting, NA, CA, I mean, just give, you give me a 12 step meeting, I was there. And um, my sponsor, Sally, um, who's always been my sponsor, you know, she's like, hey, you can sit in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and we can go through the steps, you know, and we can go through the steps and you can write about your drug use and I'll take you through the steps that way. And even when I'm in, in a meeting, I, again, don't identify that I'm a drug addict too, but I will just quietly just, you know, I am powerless over alcohol and drugs. I just don't go on about it in a meeting. And then again, when I'm in the meeting, I'm identifying only as an alcoholic. Um, And rather than going to all these other 12 step meetings for me, for me, I just planted my butt in Alcoholics Anonymous and work the steps around those other addictions. But again, identifying only as an alcoholic in a meeting of AA. Another reason why that is so important is through history, right? Through history. Um, and Sally will be able to quote the exact places in the big book better than I can. But they talk about the program, right? Being watered down, right? You know, and one way of not watering it down is to stick to the singleness of purpose when we're in that meeting, you know, and I sponsor um, several, well, I sponsor two girls right now. Both of them are duly addicted. And again, when I took them through the steps, we took, I took them through the steps over alcohol and their other addiction, right? But again, when you're in the meetings of AA, identifying only as um, an alcoholic. So that's just my two cents on that. I really believe in singleness and purpose. Thank you. Yeah. So I think if you went to an overeaters anonymous meeting and you said, I'm Sally, I'm an overeater and an alcoholic, they would go, okay, but why are you identifying as an alcoholic? or a gambler's anonymous meeting. I'm Sally, I'm a gambler and I'm an alcoholic. They would go, why are you here for your alcoholism? And I think it's the same with Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't go in there and say, I'm alcoholic and overeater or I'm alcoholic and a gambler because again, those places have their own 12 step program, which by the way, also has their own singleness of purpose. So it's important, I think, to identify only as an alcoholic when in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, And to Abby's point that when I work with these girls that have all these other addictions that, you know, sitting at my kitchen table one-on-one, then I can share all of my junk as they can also share their stuff too. So. Super. Huh? Charlie. Hey, my name is Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Charlie. Awful glad to be able to participate in this. Um, I was thinking, um, you know, I have to share that two weeks ago, my son came to me and told me that he was strung out on meth. And I had to get him into detox. And we did that. And now... I need to get him to go to meetings. And it doesn't matter whether it's AA or NA or or any other of those programs. This program has been given a gift 
and it's been proven to work for millions of people. And I want that for my son. I want him to be able to be coming here. And my home group has changed drastically in the last three years. I would say that 75% of the people in my home group identify as an alcoholic and a, and it's not an issue. Those people are doing the program. Those people are starting to celebrate years. These principles will work in most cases. So I don't, you know, as an Alaska native, I can identify with discrimination and I don't think it should be a part of this program. I think this program is strong enough, the principles are strong enough to withstand any outside issues. We will still be able to carry the message. We will still be able to practice our code. I'm a firm believer that that code saved my life because they did love me when I came in here. They did tolerate me when I came in here and that hasn't changed or it shouldn't change. We should still make this a safe place for anybody that comes in here. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Any other, any other questions or shares around um, singleness of perfect purpose? This, is, this has been really, really helpful for me to my understand name's, a little bit more. My name's Rick. Hey, Rick. And I'll just uh, throw in the, and I heard this before, and I don't know how applicable it really is or not, but the idea that I'm, I'm special, mm. I have, it's like, it's like, um, my name is Rick, uh, Rick Smith the Third Esquire, <laughs> or I'm Rick, Rick Smith the Third PhD, MSD, M O U S E. Um, I think there's a, a, a an I'm special component that happens when people start stacking um, stacking identifiers on the end of their name. Uh, and I, I've heard that brought up before, and I just wanted to to bring that up because that doesn't that doesn't keep me right sized to because uh, I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and that's what I'm what I'm focused on. Um, now that the steps certainly helped me stop smoking dope, and and I've used those for other parts of my life, but I had to learn it in Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Okay, well, let's let's move on. I'm going to go back to kind of the the first question in the um, uh, for the for the panel. So the question is, um, what do you think is important when sponsoring someone who has also uh, struggled with uh, with outside issues, as we would say, as we would say, drug addiction. Um, yeah. So, does anyone want to anyone want to start on the panel? Janet, alcoholic addict. Oops. Here I go, alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been doing it for such a long time, and I don't think I'm special or unique either. And I know that that wasn't geared to me, but I I really like I said the only reason why I've done it all these years is because it reminds me of where I came from. But I do understand the singleness of purpose. Um but so drugs and alcohol to me, my experience that is that they go hand in hand. And so when I'm working with a sponsee, it it's specific to what they are going through. And so when they go through their steps, I go through them I go through mine with them as well. We do it together. Um, however, um, to address, I when I work with my sponsees, I address all mood and mind altering, mind altering drugs. So the thing that you know comes up a lot is um, medications, and I know there's another question on it. Um, so, but in regards to that. Um, what I've always been able to do is let them know that 
as long as they're taking their prescription as prescribed by their doctor, that it's okay if they, and to, you know, make sure that they, um, I always check with my sponsor when I, when I've had surgeries or when I've had to take something it, that was prescribed to me, that was a, a narcotic. And I said, no, I don't want to take it. I don't want to take it. And she said, it's okay if you take it, as long as you're not taking it to get high. And as long as you let you write it down and, and do it, take it as prescribed. So that's just that. And I, I feel that strong boundaries are very, very important um, active listening is very important and open communication. When I'm when I'm sitting with a sponsee, that that's where we get into the nitty gritty. But going in the meetings, no, it's it's sharing it in a general way, what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. And sometimes, you know, when I first got sober down at the little blue house, it was like, oh my gosh, okay, I didn't really need to know that. But guess what? I ad identified with it. But then that sponsor was able to say, this is something we need to talk about by ourselves. Anyway, um, and so prioritizing the understanding between the different struggles uh, with both alcohol and drugs and the different situations, you know, because of, of the past that I have of, of being, you know, in, in, in shady places, drug houses and things like that. And the per the person that I'm working with, if they've gone through that, we can talk about it. Uh, um, people, places, and things, slippery places. I mean, to some people, a bar is the slippy slipperiest. Some people, the the grocery store is. When I got sober, there wasn't alcohol in a grocery store, and um, you know, so um, and then uh, I hear again, you know, actively working the twelve steps and the potential triggers of both alcohol and drugs my um i i don't want to get into it i i just what i went through with that sponsee that passed away i learned a lot from that but it's still it's still very very difficult because i believed everything she said because i don't I believed everything she said, so I, I didn't know what to do because I believed her, you know. And so anyway, that that was a very so the strong boundaries and, and the regular check ins, not just a text message when you haven't heard from somebody that you are working with and, the, and they have that drug addiction in their in their past and you haven't heard from them. That's a red flag for me. Um, I think that's enough on that. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. A quick, quick question for you um, and for any panelists. That's just a side to this. Is so. Um, my background is um, just just alcoholism. Do you think someone can sponsor someone else that has that is duly addicted that is not duly addicted, or is it, should you counsel them to find someone else, or should you just let it let that the sponsee determine whether or not they feel like you're a good good match is it is it that important or not or what what is it any thoughts on that maybe um maybe the next person who shares can add that in into their answer okay mm. david uh i'm david swanson recovered alcoholic um so interesting to like get up and come over here and stand in front of you people, right? And then like sit down. It's like I'm coming and putting these hats off and on. Um, the, so based on my, so here's my, my experience is powerful for primarily um, a reason that applies I think to the difference between traditional Alcoholics Anonymous and modern Alcoholics Anonymous. And let me wrap this up. I was here in Alcoholics Anonymous for 12 years, right? In Seattle, going to meetings, being cool, um, carrying that message, right? We had workbooks, we had add-ons, we had extra things. We had workbooks about feelings and all of this um, 
stuff that's important, right? These, these are all things that exacerbated my drinking, but they were never at the core of my drinking. And, and what was happening to me was I was essentially, um, you know, the meeting was kind of replacing the drink for me. And, and as soon as I'd get out of a meeting within a couple of hours, I was feeling miserable again, right? Like I wasn't, I wasn't running the recipe that carried the solution that uh, would lead to recovery. Um, I love what your question was and your additional question, because <clears throat> here is the powerful part of my story. It's like the question up here on the board is, what do you think is most important when sponsoring someone? Well, the most important thing when sponsoring someone is their relationship with their higher power, right? Because it says in our ABCs, I'm not going to get anybody sober, right? And one of the things that was pointed out to me really early on was when I got sober with, you know, these guys bouncing back and forth between Los Angeles and here was, you know, some of the things they narrowed down is like, what is the first direction in alcohol? It's anonymous. And, and uh, you know, and that's a tough question for a lot of people to answer. A lot of people don't, they, we miss it, right? For me, getting sober in Los Angeles meant that each day I had certain sponsorship directions. There were things I was going to do. There were places I was going to go. And I really didn't have any say in that. You know, I was going to be calling alcoholics each day, asking them how they were doing. I was going to be making my bed when I got up. I was, going to, I was just learning to follow directions. I was also thrown in with a group of other guys that were new in recovery. Right, because that's why I was going to be identified. I could not identify with my sponsor who had 30 years sober, right? Who had a house on Tiger Mountain, who financially had everything, he had four cars in the driveway, right? Like that was just not going to happen. But what worked for me was I was in with all these newer people and we were doing things together and we had our directions and our sponsorship lineage kind of kept this gate around us. Well, that gate mirrors the meetings that we had in the living rooms in these small communities all over America when Alcoholics Anonymous was growing up. And the book really specifically, something I missed in the book the first time was, as we do this thing shoulder to shoulder, we're demonstrating in our families, in our homes, how this program works to the person that's new. And the other huge part of it was, I wasn't invited to do any of this stuff till I'd reached a level of surrender that they were satisfied, met the mark of getting started in this program. So, you know, to me, that's my experience. At, at year 10, my first time around, they, my nickname was Angry Dave. Um, by year 12, I was out. And um, I never got one bit, one iota of relief of the deep, bitter core loneliness in my first 12 years of going to meetings in Seattle because um, the, the solution as it is laid out in this book can be a little bit elusive from time to time. And we have a lot of, we have a lot of meetings that um, are a lot of young people come out of a lot of treatment centers and they might have a treatment center counselor there at the meeting or something guiding them or their idea of the big book. But the truth is, um, for me, the history is the history is key because the history holds the secret of what we were doing. And it's and it's um, and it's not so cut and dry. And it's not um, you know, it's not so rigid. So today, you know, I sponsor currently right now, I'm sponsoring. Uh, five guys, right? I'm at a meeting attendance, uh, two meetings a week with my sponsor, other people, my sponsor, sponsors, the guys, my guys sponsor, right? Like we uh, we do a, a breakfast once, a speaker meeting, a breakfast once a month. It is so important that once we start building our one or two uh, sponsees that we're able to group them together with other new sponsees and other people we're shoulder to shoulder with because this deal picks up a lot more energy when there's six or seven in a meeting all on that same page. And we've got the four or five guys coming in from treatment. We're picking up and driving in from Milam. So, um, you know, Los Angeles, the group I got sober and has this at an even a larger level. And, and at times I crave that and go down there to recharge my batteries. But it is so important that when we are, uh, we're not just shoulder to shoulder, but these new people 
we're guiding through this book, have other new people to get out and do a bunch of meetings with. And quite frankly, um, I'm not going to go to seven meetings a week, but I expect them to. So I want them out there with other new people in the car, uh, you know, being in places we know we can um, we can present this program to them. So um, I hope hopefully that's, that's helpful no, that's with your great. question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sally, you want to share? Um, sure. So what do I think is important when sponsoring someone who also struggles with drug addiction? Because I also struggle with drug addiction. Um, I'm able to, um, to relate to the girls that I sponsor and often people that I don't sponsor because I have that drug addiction. Um, I really like what you said. I do a, a Sunday morning meeting and it's on Zoom and I do it with um, the girls that I sponsor and my, spo and my sponsor. And we get together every Sunday and, um, you know, we, we talk, it's just a one hour meeting and we pick a topic and we can talk about it or not. And it's really built a great community um, and strong AA and like thinking about our steps and our program and our meetings and, um, you know, and, and so I, re I really liked what he was talking about how, you know, we do stand shoulder to shoulder and, you know, hanging out with people that are like thinkers is really helpful. You know, as a person with long term sobriety, it's kind of scary to see some of the stuff that's filtering in to Alcoholics Anonymous. And years ago, there was a gentleman, I think he was the president of GSO, and he said that the downfall of Alcoholics Anonymous will come from within. And that scares me because I am not going to survive without this program. I stay very plugged into AA and I have for all these years and I don't have any um, uh, idea of stopping that. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, the Federal Detention Center um, I was, uh, I was, I'm, I'm grateful that I was part of starting the AA meetings in there. And the um, guy that named that meeting, because we let the inmates name the meeting, and the guy that named the meeting had some long term sobriety. And he was so busy not paying attention to the traditions and so busy sponsoring and service and doing all this other stuff that he did not work on himself. And he wound up relapsing and in the federal detention center, you know, and I keep that story in my mind because it's a good reminder of why I want to keep plugged into this program. So sponsoring someone that struggles with drug addiction, you know, again, they don't get to be an alcoholic addict. And that's one of the first things that I tell them. They're only alcoholic. And yes, I can sponsor people that have drug addictions because I also have that. But I don't, you know, go on and on about that in a meeting of AA. So um, I just want to speak to prescription drugs because Janet had brought that up. You know, prescription drugs are okay to take. However, you do need to follow the... Um, the, the prescription and that can be a um, mind it can mess with your mind um you know i've had many occasions in my years of sobriety where i have had to take some kind of narcotic for a surgery or something and i stay really connected with my sponsor and mm -hmm. the people around me and i make sure that if it says one every four hours that i'm not taking it on the second or third hour um, you know, I take it on the fourth hour. If I need it before that, I can call the doctor and get an okay for that. So, you know, um, I, I think that it's really important. Um, there's also a meeting that um, I don't go to it often, but if you announce in the meeting that you are on like antidepressants, they won't even let you make coffee. <laughs> they won't let you greet. They won't let you chair. They won't. And so one of the, one of the uh, things that I tell the girls I sponsor that are on some kind of um, mood or mind altering drug, you know, mental health medications, I just tell them don't bring it up in an AA meeting. For one thing, it's inappropriate. And for another thing, there's so much judgment around that, that uh, you won't be able to be the greeter or the coffee maker um, at some of these meetings. So thanks. Um, Abby, so you have your hand raised. 
Thank you, Abby, alcoholic, loving the discussion. And I just wanted to maybe add or just highlight some of these pamphlets that I've read recently that have been really helpful with this topic. Um, first one, pamphlet P11, mm -hmm. the AA member medications and other drugs. Um, so... In here, it says no AA member should play doctor. All medical advice and treatment should come from a qualified physician. Um, so I just love that. And I love the reminder, like, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a professional. I'm not a doctor. I have sponsees, you know, who struggle with uh, uh drug addiction, also, you know, mental health and take prescribed medication. So what what is helpful for me is to encourage them and to encourage myself to be open and honest with my medical professionals, my doctors and tell, you know, be open. I am an alcoholic or I am an addict. And so that they know that about me, you know, or know that about them and can prescribe appropriate medications. Um, I don't, I have no opinion, you know, I try to remove my opinion of the, of the, of the medication and refer to the professional. Um, I, yeah, but, you know, as alcoholics, you know, we're, we're not immune to the uh, effects that these prescriptions can have on us it is important to be aware you know um also another pamphlet problems other than alcohol p35 uh was a really great read um it talks about all the things oh my goodness like so there's so much stuff that we as aas cannot do for you know narcotics addicts now what can be done it talks in this pamphlet about uh, special purpose groups. You know, the first special purpose group was created in 1938, another one in 1940 in New York, you know, where as individuals, we can carry the AA experience and ideas into any outside field, whatever, provided that we guard anonymity and refuse to use the AA name for money raising or publicity purposes, you know, so back to that point of like, I can use my own experience, strength and hope on an individual basis with some people. Um, and then this other pamphlet, uh, P87, AA for Alcoholics with Mental Health Issues. You know, I've just found this really helpful with sponsees who have, you know, like bipolar. And I know that isn't like the topic of this exactly, but people take medications for these things, you know. So um, this pamphlet has been super helpful for sponsees and myself. It says, and their sponsors, you know, how can how can I help people with who take medications for these other outside intense mental health issues, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, so I think that's enough out of me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Abby. That's great. Um, Janet, uh, if you did, I did I already call on you. I, I don't think you shared on this one. Yeah, I did. I was okay. the first one. I think. And, right. Yeah, that's I was sad. just giving my my heart to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I loved what Abby had to say. Um, anyone else on this question? Uh, just in attendees, any anything you found particularly helpful when when sponsoring somebody that's duly addicted? I have a. I'm, I guess. Go ahead. I'm Rick. I'm Rick, alcoholic. Um, <clears throat> yes. I. I. What do I think is important? Um, I think it's important if I'm sponsor, it's important to know that they got this other stuff going on. And that would give me an opportunity to talk about the fifth tradition and uh, get them, uh, I guess, acclimated to, to focusing on, on uh, alcoholism in meetings. This is, this is the, the essence of what I'm hearing today is that when we're working together, it's, we can we can be much broader 
in our in our focus. But when we're at a meeting, when we're sharing at a meeting, the focus is more specific to alcoholism. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, here's guys again. I'm still relatively new. Here's a really basic question: Do do people who have serious struggles with multiple things do they do some people have two sponsors? Is that like a thing? Hmm. I don't know. It looks like Dan is raising his hand. Uh, Dan, yeah. I just wanted to say that my sponsor told me you could have as many sponsors and as many home groups as you wanted to have. There aren't any restrictions on that. But uh, I guess as a sponsor, I can also say that if things aren't working out with a sponsee, I've got every opportunity I want to get up and say, I've had enough of this BS and I'm out of here. Yeah. yeah, I'm specifically thinking like if someone struggles with narcotics or opioids or something like that, do they have an NA sponsor and an AA sponsor? Is that, I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, I don't see. Rick, Rick? Uh, Rick alcoholic. My understanding is that when people have multiple sponsors, they tend to uh, bring their questions to the sponsor who will give them the answer they most want. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that becomes the, the problem with that. Yeah. Anyway, okay. yeah. Janet, alcoholic. I totally I understand that, Rick. And that's what I was going to say. I've gone through that myself. And then I had a gal call me and I said, well, what did your sponsor say? And she said the same thing you did. <laughs> so it's like, we, we, that's what we do. We, we have that, you know, I mean, that's what I used to do. And so um, it's, it is, I've never had both. I've never had an AA sponsor and an NA sponsor. I haven't felt the need to because I get what I, I get everything I need with from my higher power and from this program. Yeah, absolutely. Shannon. Um, Shannon, alcoholic. Um, yeah. And so one of the things my sponsor said is, you know, you have one sponsor, you know, I'm an alcoholic and um, a drug addict, but I have one AA sponsor, right? And I have one home group. Doesn't mean that I don't go to other meetings. And the reason why is I don't have, you know, like four AA sponsors is because, you know, as you guys already mentioned, is I would go and seek different answers, right? And then by having one AA sponsor, that person knows me inside and out. I'm not a secret to that person. The same with my home group, right? So I have one home group that I'm accountable to. I show up, you know, they know me, they know my story. Doesn't mean again that I, I don't have other, you know, meetings that I go to or even service commitments, but one AA um, sponsor and one AA home group. And I do have experience of working um, and then also on the, the drugs and stuff. I've never felt the need to have an NA sponsor um, because my sponsor, you know, has already, I mean, she, she was duly addicted to drugs. And again, when I went through the, the steps and, you know, um, I went around on alcoholism and drugs, right? So it worked out. I have actually sponsored um, younger people years ago that were alcoholics and also addicted to substances, drugs. And um, that worked out for a while until one decided that she was not really an alcoholic um, and that she was a drug addict. And so I, you know, we had to go our separate ways because I said, you know, she started drinking and I'm like, you know what, I'm an alcoholic first and foremost, you identified as an alcoholic. Now you're just saying you're a drug addict. That's fine. You need to go find a sponsor in NA. In this course, it was NA because I couldn't relate to that. Um, I've also had another sponsee years ago that was, 
an alcoholic and also a drug addict. Um, Pot was a great example. And so she started using um, marijuana. This is before it was legal um, for medical purposes. And um, she would call me and check in and she was completely stoned. I mean, completely stoned. I mean, she called me at three o'clock, couldn't remember if she had checked in earlier and, you know, again, was using it for medical purposes, but I did not feel comfortable sponsoring her, right? I just did not feel comfortable sponsoring her, whether that triggered something in me. Um, and I just said, you know, you need to get yourself um, a sponsor in NA, um, and particularly because you're using um, marijuana in this case for medical purposes. Um, I just can't identify with that, right? You know, I can't identify with it. So I, I couldn't be of any service to her. You know, that wasn't my experience. So that's all I have on that. And you guys, I'm so sorry, but I do have to go to another commitment. This has been a wonderful meeting. Um, a shout out to Sally. Bye. <laughs> you know? So I'll see you guys later. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Bye. Uh, my name is Larry. I'm an alcoholic. I probably don't need to speak, but here I am. Uh, so <laughs> take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I think it's important to, when I'm sponsoring somebody with drug addiction, that, um, like I said, for identification purposes, um, the hope when, you know, when I'm working with somebody is that they're going to turn around and help somebody else, yeah. right? That's the whole, that's what we do. And so if they're not clear about what they're powerless over, they might not be able to be clear about who it is they'll be able to in turn help. Um, you know, I, uh, there's, a, there's a sentiment in Alcoholics Anonymous that we need to be all inclusive and helpful to everyone who walks into, who darkens the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, regardless of what their affliction is. Bill Wilson talks very explicitly about how we can't be helpful to all people. And in fact, it will harm Alcoholics Anonymous in order to do that. However, anybody can attend an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous um, at any time. Uh, and it does say in some of our literature as observers only. But that being said, open Alcoholics Anonymous meetings are for anybody who's interested in finding out more about Alcoholics Anonymous or living a sober life, I suppose. There are 12 step programs um, for other, other addictions, right? And I know that we're the mothership and I know that it's hard to find quality sobriety in some of these other 12 step programs. I, I've been to them, I've seen it, I know that it's difficult. And I've, I've heard that story. And, and that, that, you know, that's unfortunate. Um, the thing to do would be to make those programs stronger, right? For the people who are coming behind you, you know? Um, so somebody who isn't an alcoholic, sobering up in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not sure where they're gonna be able to be of service uh, within the program once they get to a point where it's their turn to carry the message to the still suffering alcoholic? No, they're not an alcoholic. Well, where are they gonna go to carry the message and be of service because that's what we do to, in order to stay sober. Um, and just, I, I, you know, I sort of, it's, it's a strong sentiment that we're supposed to be everything to all people in Alcoholics Anonymous and I, and I just have to stand up and disagree. It's not a very, um, it's not a popular opinion uh, to be, have singleness of purpose. And, um, uh, uh, but as an old timer, you know, when I was first getting sober and before I understood, uh, the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have, you know, hated to hear what I just said. So, um, so that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to keep saying it anyway, because at some point it's about Alcoholics Anonymous. It's about, not about how I'm feeling, right. Or how, the newcomer is feeling. It's about the larger purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, there is a 12-step program called All Addicts Anonymous. Um, if it, you know, so there is something for everyone. Um, I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous needs to turn into All Addicts Anonymous because there is a program like that that already exists. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, 
David. Yes, David, back in front of you. Um, it would be nice. Be nice if we just had little microphones like ding, 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 ding. Um, would be anyways. Um, I want to speak a little bit on you know just kind of back to uh, my experience of this LA versus Seattle deal. And, um, you know, the group I was a member of in Los Angeles, like the woman was saying, she had only one home group. Well, you know, I had one home group in Los Angeles too. They had seven meetings a week and they were active. They did five or six panels a week. Um, they were active in a lot of different places. And one of the things that was shared with me, like I begin to ask questions like, why am I always going, you know, I mean, I was always going somewhere and always doing something to the point of like, you know, it was wearing me out and I would complain to my sponsor and, you know, they kind of laugh at me and they take me back to that part of like, you know, well, you, you know, did you drink every day? It's like, yeah, you know, then you probably need to be at a meeting every day. And, um, and today that's not true for me. You know, today I'm at a meeting about three days a week because as I've recovered from this, I've gone on to do other things in, in normal life, um, you know, outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, but those, I'm still running that same recipe, right? I'm useful in my community. I'm showing up to do things. I'm supporting other things in the community, um, you know, with children in school and, you know, marriage and family and all this stuff. We have all these other things um, that are part of this, this bigger life that um, comes from, you know, these early days of, of where uh, we all start. So I think, you know, in a lot of these questions is I don't want to forget in these questions that, you know, I, what I'm saying today is a whole bunch different, you know, way different than 10 years ago, right? And how I felt and what I did. And I think, unfortunately, in Seattle, with a lot of meetings, right, we have 1500 meetings, um, it's getting back to one of these arguments that's going around the block right now, like what's a meeting and what's a group? And, um, you know, and this brings me back to once again, let's go back historically to where this program started and um, what was the true definition of fellowship, right? The book in chapter seven talks about fellowship. What does that mean? It doesn't mean 1500 meetings a week in Seattle because we didn't have 1500 meetings a week when we wrote that book. So I think when we look at the historic piece of, we did uh, this deal shoulder to shoulder. These get togethers were in people's homes in the living room, right? And the al to be were apparently in the kitchen. Um, we also had the biggest piece, and I keep hearing this pop up and people sharing that of uh, the stories about people they sponsored that have like slipped away and died. And as sad as that may be, you know, the original, prerequisite to joining Alcoholics Anonymous was the surrender. And you were, until you surrendered and you worked some of these steps, you were not invited into the, we weren't really let you come in and dilute the message in our meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, um, and so how do we do that today? Like, you know, how do we, you know, where is that surrender at and where and when do we start within that step work of people? And then as a true, you know, our third tradition with all these open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous is, you know, anybody's invited. So I think, you know, from where we started originally, where we had these higher numbers of recovery and where we're at today, servicing a broader spectrum of people. Uh, and a broader spectrum and choices of how we're going to get loaded. You know, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if Dr. Bob had fentanyl and crack, you know, uh, it would be in his story, right? Because he was at, you know, he was spiritually connected in the Oxford group trying to get this deal, right? Like, but just missing the part of servicing other alcoholics. But don't, don't kid yourself, man. Dr. Bob was perhaps our our most glaring first not our first drug I can guess uh, yeah I guess he's well it's our first drug addict um but you know Dr. Bob's story just look at it closely he was our glaring you know he is definitely our addict alcoholic and maybe even more of an addict um in a lot of ways um and definitely narcotics prescription medication 
They were doctor prescribed. He was the doctor prescribing. So I just enjoy the rhetorical circle that sometimes these conversations and alcohol synonymous can be. I mean, I think my higher power has a sense of humor. So he's always going to keep me um, entertained, to say the least. <laughs> okay. Um. This, <clears throat> this next question is kind of a corollary, so I, I'm not going to necessarily go through every single panel member, but if, if any one of the panel members has something you think, uh, we've talked a little bit about this, but what, you know, what should you avoid um, or what problems have you encountered? Janet, alcoholic. Janet? Um, I try to avoid things that um i potentially did when i got sober and i i you had these excuses and and different and different i guess reasons why i w didn't want to do something or why do i have to call you every day um things like that and so basically what i have learned is to be supportive loving caring, compassionate. However, I can't coddle. And, you know, every sponsee is different. I understand that. I can be supporting, loving, kind, compassionate, and understanding without coddling somebody. Um, the, 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 and the nature of what happened with that sponsee that I've been referring to is that I, it was, I was enabling that person. And that is what was done to me until I got clean and sober. My mom enabled me and so many people enabled me. I am not as a sponsor. I am not, um, it's not my job to be a uh, babysitter or to be a marriage counselor or to be a lawyer or to be a bank and, I made those mistakes. I made those mistakes by, I, I said, this is not, now I know this is not something that I can do. If the answer is not in the big book, then it's, or something that I've gone through myself, then I can't give that advice. And um, another big one for me is um, the uh, the manipulation and uh, to avoid that, to avoid that by, you know, the manipulation. I, I know my part and I know that I did, did take that manipulation and I, and, and I learned from it. So th those are things that I've gone through with some, with some sponsees. And uh, the other thing too, is there's one thing I really, really want to know from people that have been doing this longer. If you're working with a sponsee and they have relapsed three times while you have worked with them, do you continue to work with them even though they've done? I feel like I don't have what they need. That's just what I've learned. So I just want to know that answer. Thank you. And, um, and, Anita? Yeah. Hi, my name's Anita and I'm an alcoholic. And I just want you to know that, that during this workshop, Dan, who's answering phones here, did um, hook a woman up who's at the downtown YMCA. She's duly addicted. She just needs someone to talk to. And um, so, yeah, we've got uh, Susan F. to uh, call that woman. And Susan is perfect for this. So I... I with the question that's posed, uh, I want to talk or mention that my most frustrating experience uh, working with other women is uh, I sobered up at South End Fellowship. And in the early 2000s, they they built a little house called Catherine's House. And and the women were required at that time to come over to, to SEF right next door to attend the meeting. And a lot of them were uh, sex workers. 
alcoholic, drug addicted, mentally ill, but sex workers as well, which uh, I was completely unprepared and uh, was was not help. I, in my opinion, I was not helpful for these women at all. And um, I don't, I don't know that I am after, you know, going forward some years, I still don't know if I'd be able to uh, work with someone uh, with that, with that problem. It seems like it's, it's maybe not another addiction, but maybe a mental illness, but the, the, the self-harm and the, uh, the beating up of oneself is uh, troubling, very troubling. The other uh, big, big mistake I made, I was working with someone again at South End Fellowship. This was fairly recently. And um, I I used a word that, that I'll never use again when I, when I work with other women and it's survive because she was having trouble uh, getting along at South End Fellowship. And which is not an unusual thing. It, it it's uh it, it can be very uh, chaotic there. So I told her, I will help you survive South End Fellowship. I will help you survive this. I will get you through this. And, and uh, she was deeply offended and said that she's not she didn't come here just to learn to survive a fellowship that she was hoping that there would be more to this than just learning how to survive a little blue house and the characters that are in it. So those are uh, just two of the uh, mistakes that I've made working with others. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, so I've sponsored this gal for about five years now. She currently has, um, again, like two weeks of sobriety. So I am, uh, to totally speak to Janet, I know a little bit about your program. And I don't think that as a sponsor that I'm going to make or break the sponsee. I just don't believe that. I believe it's up to the sponsee. So I'll keep this girl till the cows come home. I, I mean, I have what I have. She wants what I have, or she wouldn't keep coming back. She can't stay sober, but I don't, you know, I'm not a um, proponent of breaking up with my sponsor. Either. I don't do that because what I've come to know over the years is that they'll just go away. I don't have to do that. They'll just go away. However, in the vein of enabling, I do not do that. I would rather say something that was uh, blunt and to the point to get a point across and have them never speak to me again than to stand over their grave and go, boy, I wish I would have said that. And so, um, you know, I, one of the first things I do when someone says, will you be my sponsor is I have three questions. I ask them, are you alcoholic? Because it's AA and we're going to go through the book uh, based on alcoholism I ask them, um, are you willing to go to any lengths for your sobriety? And that one always comes back to bite them in the ass because they don't want to follow the direction, which by the way, the word direction is riddled all through our big book. You know, people like to go, well, it's just a suggestion. But for me, I can go, well, I didn't really have to do that because it was just a suggestion. So I lean towards the word direction. And so are you willing to go to any lengths you know, I can remind them frequently when they aren't calling every day, when they aren't following the clear cut directions that uh, were given to me. And then in turn, I pass down. And the other is, are you willing to pass this on as it was passed on to you? Because I try not to um, have the girls that I work with do anything that I have not done. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I have not already done. So, um, you know, again, as a sponsor, I can't, you know, they're either going to get it or they're not. And people change sponsors like they do their underwear. And it's not about the sponsor. It's about the person being willing to follow the clear cut directions. So. Thank you, Sally. Abby? Thank you, Abby, alcoholic, 
Um, I guess first to Janet's question, I just want to highlight I'm big in the pamphlets right now. So <laughs> pamphlet P15 questions and answers on sponsorship. I have experience with a sponsee, you know, who would keep relapsing and it was really hard not to take, you know, be like, oh no, what am I, what am I doing wrong? Um, but in this pamphlet, you know, there's a section, how should a, a sponsor deal with slips that I found to be really helpful. Um, this one little paragraph uh, regarded realistically, the slip can become a learning experience for both the person sponsored and the sponsor. For the sponsor, it may serve as a push toward humility, a reminder that one person cannot keep another person sober, and that the 12th step says, we tried to carry this message. Um, so I found that to be very helpful. And, and then in regard to the question posed for the panel, um, what do you think is important to avoid when dealing with the duly addicted? What problems or pitfalls have you encountered? Um, something that just, I guess, came to mind um, was having a, a sponsee who was addicted to an over-the-counter medication and they hadn't drank I don't for like years maybe but kept relapsing on this substance so it it was hard for me I think it's still hard for me but so not pretending I guess like I have the answer for that you know because it it was it was different you know the the effects of, of the body taking this other medication and so one thing that i did was send her information on narcotics anonymous you know a list of meetings zoom meetings that were accessible if she couldn't get to them you know and and um but she didn't like it. <laughs> she didn't like it. And she's like, oh, I just need AA. But so I think more that's something that maybe a, a problem pitfall or something that I've struggled with is, you know, what am I? How could I help her? If she's coming to me, she wants me like <laughs> she wants me what I have. And yet I don't have experience with this addiction. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah I'll pass. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Any other? <clears throat> Charlie? Charlie, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Charlie. To change the paradigm, we do have a solution. Oh, that's, that was one thing. When I came into this program, it was popular to say, my big book says. And if you said, I think, they would boo you out of the room. <laughs> my big book says we have a solution and that our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics stay sober and if we stand on that that means we we're not getting enmeshed in all this other stuff we're trying to share the message of Alcoholics Anonymous period I go back to our code because that helped me so much again love and tolerance I, I'm thinking, you know, as a counselor, ex-counselor, I was a counselor for 30 years. And, and our code of ethics was to do no harm. So I was taught early on that you stay in that. This was up in Alaska. You stay in your job for three years and that's it. Period. Move on. Your clients are going to start coming back and don't waste their time. You had the opportunity and you did not help them move on. So if you look at my resume, you'll see that I've never had a job over three years. And I'm proud of that fact. So again, we do have a solution and it's in the big book. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Sure. David? Uh, David Swanson, recovered alcoholic. Um, 
So what really helped me um, through this, um, the way I was sponsored was when somebody would go back out and come back in, right, and uh, they would relapse, my sponsor would ask them, hmm, do you have a sponsor? Hmm, do you have a home group? Hmm, do you have a service position? We're taking another alcoholics to meetings. Hmm, what were you relapsing from? Right? And uh, my little pet peeve, of course, is, uh, I, I, is uh, trigger is a horse and trigger is dead. There's no such thing as a trigger in alcoholics anonymous. We don't have that word anywhere in our big book. Um, that has become a term that was brought in in the late 80s into our treatment centers as an out. It was a way for families to feel good about spending all this money to get Jimmy into a program that was going to make him uh, cookie cutter fit into society um, the way his family wanted him to. And unfortunately, what works, you know, we know that now that that's not how this all worked out. And, and, and fortunately for us, we know a lot more. I was sponsored for by a doctor, um, my first run through Alcoholics Anonymous for a short period of time. And it was very helpful because he was very open minded. You know, uh, the mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work unless it's open. And he believes that someday we will actually find a way medically to reverse this thing. He says, it may not be in your lifetime or my lifetime, but as a physician, I believe. And, um, and you know that, and that's a cool um, opinion. Uh, I think importantly, you know, is this is about sponsorship here, right? So this is about how we show up in front of these new people. Uh, and I think it's really important as they're coming in, uh, we're catching them right as they're coming in out of treatment. Um, you know, in the 80s, in the grapevine, somebody wrote an article about a meeting format called the general discussion meeting. And the general discussion meeting is now the majority of our meeting formats. And with that is an opportunity for people to come in and share how their day is, what's going on in their lives. And because we're bringing people in that are fresh, you know, even still in treatment, you know, they're only going to share what they've got. And all they've got is this treatment message. And, you know, we let them share the book study. But one of the things we do is, you know, when the book study's over, um, we get that opportunity to talk with them a little bit and explain to them the difference between like, yeah, treatment's going to promise you, you know, they're going to have you locked up. You're going to be sober most likely for 28 days. The difference between treatment and Alcoholics Anonymous is my big book promises me that, you know, after I've done everything in this big book, I can go down to the crack house at the end of the street and do a 12 step call and I'm going to stay sober with another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so we begin to give them hope, but it's important for us to just, you know, show up in that, to be loving, but to show up with some excitement, right? Like if we don't have excitement, like, you know, <laughs> What if what have I got to share with you? I like I really like what that lady said about the woman saying if all I'm doing is showing up in Alcoholics Anonymous to survive the AA club, there's nothing here for me. Oh yeah, I say stuff like that all the time. I say that if you know my um, worst day in Alcoholics Anonymous is better than my best day drinking. Oh, I ain't got nothing for you. I ain't, I shouldn't have anything you want. Um, but if we show up and this is fun. Um, and we have this solution and we have this hope um, because we do have this core. You know, I like what you were saying about the big book. Like, you know, my big book says this. You know, I think all that stuff's important. Um, but once again, it's, you know, we do, um, it, it's helpful to have a couple of different meetings that we are attached to part of maybe old service positions in so we can carry a message because one of the things is like i get these new guys in and sometimes new women right because they're all they're looking for you know they're looking to you know maybe dodge the court stuff or you know a lot of people are coming to alcoholics anonymous to just get the get out of the heat for a minute you know that's that's what got me here right i was just willing to get out of the heat for a minute and uh you know, um, 
where I start, I'm really careful with people coming in new is I'll sit down and take the time because so many people like to get sober in the AA club. And my grand sponsor in Los Angeles, he got sober in the AA club and he talks about the AA club. Um, so when people are new, I kind of sit them down I'm like, yeah, it's okay to get sober and hang out at the AA club all day and grab ass and, you know, I'll do all this other stuff. Um, but I explained to them the difference between the AA club and AA group and an AA meeting, right? And what kind of recovery is done in every piece because it's also important for those new people coming in to realize that because of our third tradition, heavy drinkers do land in Alcoholics Anonymous and this becomes their social outlet, right? And let's not confuse that with the program of recovery when it's time to save somebody's life. Um, because if you're hearing a message of a healthy green or sitting on the wall in the AA club, right, who can tell you, hey, I chose not to drink today, or this is my drug of choice, right? That stuff can kill people because I'm the type of alcoholic, I have to drink every day. I got news for you. I don't have a drug of choice. I have a drug. My drug of choice is et cetera, and I take it once a year and I can put it back on the shelf, right? I was a, you know, they were drugs of no choice for me. And so, um, you know, I think fundamentally being able to explain those things and have that excitement and sponsorship is what gets people to believe in you long enough to begin to find the solution because they need to believe in you enough to do a bunch of this crazy stuff that they don't want to, you know, we're, we're alcoholics. We're, you know, we're only not lazy in finding our next drink. We're lazy in everything else. I mean, we're manipulative. We're clever. Like we have to have all those skills to truly be an alcoholic. So, um, you know, I, uh, I'm just, you know, if you're, um, you know, looking for better ways to be, you know, of service to these new people coming into the program, you know, when you have somebody new, you might just you have to get out for a couple of weeks and go do five or six meetings a week and just pick stuff out of the book places you want to go and maybe go say something that's uh, controversial with those meetings, right? Why not? Like it's Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but, you know, uh, for me, I have people that decide to do this program because we're just crazy enough and we're just having enough fun um, with what we do every week in Alcoholics Anonymous within the sponsorship lineage that it's not burning any one person out, but these new people have something to do and they're showing up with other people that are in that same lineage, you know, seven days a week. Um, because that's kind of, you know, that's kind of how this program um, is attractive. So, um, yeah, it's about being excited. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. <clears throat> it triggers a horse and he's dead. <laughs> um, so we're coming up. We've got about 15 minutes left and I want to leave um, five minutes um, left at the end. So so this one, this is kind of going to be our final question of, of the workshop and welcome. Also, welcome, Tammy. Uh, thanks for showing up to the sponsorship workshop. Um, so the where I, this question is actually from one of the one of the pamphlets that Abby mentioned. It says recognize that alcoholics are not immune to other diseases some of us have had to cope with depressions that can be suicidal schizophrenia that sometimes requires hospitalization bipolar and a host of other mental and biological so uh, the question here is um obviously we know that it's oh sorry i should be standing it's very common for for alcoholics to that prescription medications can be can be a real problem area so what do you counsel your sponsees uh, with regards to prescription medication. Um, and uh, yeah, so I will go ahead and sit down and um, maybe Janet, are you, is Janet still on? Do you wanna, do you wanna take a pass at this one? Sure, Janet Alcoholic. Um, what was taught to me when I first came into the program is that prescription medication must be taken as prescribed. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's um, for, for us that 
do this. We know that that's the only way that we can do it. When I'm counseling somebody new, I, I, I actually have my new sponsee that, you know, had a car accident. And I said, what did your doctor prescribe for you? And she told me, and I said, did you tell your doctor that you are a recovering alcoholic? And she said, I didn't at first, but I did. I did come clean. And she said it was the best feeling in the world. I said, they do need to know because of what going forward, what they're going to prescribe you. And so she said that she asked if she could have medication that was not narcotic. And um, he did prescribe her something that was not narcotic and that was not killing the pain. So then she called and asked me and I said, you know what? I'm not your doctor, but what I can tell you is what I've done. And that is keep track of what you're taking, write it down, write it down. That's what I've done. And I always check in with my sponsor and let her know what I'm doing. And I do not take that prescription before it's time. Like Sally said, I mean, I had a major surgery a year ago and I had oxy and I had never experienced that in my addiction. But I'll tell you what, it's a mood and mind altering drug. And so with that being said, my husband, who was also in the program, was doing it out to me. And I said, I don't need it. And he's I, but I was in severe pain. And he said, it's OK, Janet, you can take it. But mm -hmm. we kept track of it. And. That's what I've been able to do. And, you know, I I wasn't a pill popper in my addiction. That doesn't matter. I'm an, I'm an alcoholic and I'm an, an addict. And so that's why I write those things down and I keep track of them and I keep in touch with my sponsor. And I, I don't talk about it in meetings, uh, you know, as I can say, oh, I had surgery and, and, you know, the reason why I feel it's important to share what you're going through in a meeting is so that the, the people that might have to go through that, that they know that they're, that we can do this. It's okay as long as you take it as prescribed. And that's why I share it. But I don't go into detail. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> really quickly, since uh, COVID, I have had uh, shoulder surgery, two hip surgeries, and a broken neck. Oh, <laughs> so I've had lots of opportunity for um, opiate pain relief. And I totally write that stuff down. I write it down because I'll forget, <laughs> you know, because I'm you're on opiates. And, um, but I very, very, very carefully take that stuff because I'm a pill freak and I love that stuff. And I will totally go down a bad road if I don't keep it in check. And so, you know, I have these girls that I work with that I stay accountable to. I also have a sponsor that I've had for 25 years. She knows me, she knows my story. And so when I'm counseling sponsees in regards to prescription medication, I share that with them and the importance of uh, keeping track of what you're taking. I also have a new sponsee that has, uh, I'm just getting to know her, but she obviously has lots of mental health issues. And so I wanna know that she is taking her prescription medication for mental health as she's supposed to. And so, you know, we check in with each other um, around that and, you know, um, so I, I just think, you know, a lot of people in AA, like I talked about that meeting where if you take, a, you know, two aspirin as opposed to one, they won't even let you greet. And so, you know, so there's that mindset. And then there's the mindset that I have, which it's okay to take prescription medication if you need it. You know, our big book says that, you know, the steps are the answer to all our problems. And I'm not necessarily in agreement with that because I think there are problems that require mental health meds that our steps aren't going to help us with. And so for me, I think that it's okay to take that stuff if it's prescribed by your doctor. I also want to talk about really, really quickly, uh, home group. 
So I had a home group for 25 years that was um, seven days a week, three meetings a day at that, at that place. And, but my home group, as I was taught, is same day, same time, same place. So my home group, although there were 27 meetings in that particular place, was the Saturday morning 8.30 meeting. And I was there come hell or high water. And so that, and also one sponsor, because I don't know who was talking about it, but about how, you know, I'll go to, you know, 10 different people trying to get the answer I want and then go, oh yeah, that's, that's my answer. So one sponsor, one home group. Anyway, that's enough. Wonderful. I've got a quick comment. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> David Swanson. Um, so this is a three part question. And I think that two of the parts have been plucked out of this um, pretty quick. Yes, I have had, um, I was on long-term pain management for a um, crushed disc in my back for about a year. And that was probably a big part of actually me going back out in the long run. But the problem is, is it doesn't matter what at what level it's prescribed, you know, who's writing it down, how it's put together. If you're on that stuff for a year, you're going to lose your mind. That's, but you know, that's doctor prescribed and that's for pain. That's one category. The second category in this is absolutely mental health. Absolutely. That is um, mental health medications. Um, I've had guys, I, I had a grand sponsor who was actually on a pretty high amounts of lithium and had to work himself kind of backwards. You know, um, he ended up actually in Alcoholics Anonymous due to pot psych ward, um, this strong marijuana, um, then discovered that really his drinking was behind everything and had to paper back off these mental health meds. But we're leaving a third category out. And the third category of, of today is a newer category and it ties into um, this treatment center perspective that came along in um, the, the early mid nineties, right? And that's called supplemental therapy harm reduction. And this is a new category because we might take pain medication to overcome surgery, right? We might have therapies of steroids to strengthen the body, right? Cause steroids will affect your mind too in heavy doses. Um, and then we have, you know, mental health uh, medications which we may have to be on for some length of time. Those are all monitored by the doctor. But, but harm reduction and supplemental therapy to keep us from overcoming a craving to go use street drugs of the same family and nature. Um, the book, you know, um, I, I, you know, our book talks a little bit about us not being reformers, but I like to go back to... Um, you know, Bill's description of what him and Dr. Bob were doing when they visited the hospitals, right? Like they'd come in and they would be like, if you've got a drinking problem and you want some help with this, we've got a, we've got something that might work for you, right? But only if you only if you want this. We're not reformers. And I think trying to encourage somebody who's on supplemental therapy to be an Alcoholics Anonymous because maybe the court, drug court has sent them here because drug court will send you to AA and put you on methadone and suboxone, <laughs> right? So we got this stuff crashing together. And um, and that's where, you know, guys, uh, there's a couple of circuit speakers that um, have some experience as drug and alcohol counselors. And I think that's where I've gone for my guidance on this because um, my family doctor looked at my history as a alcoholic and a drug addict. And when I changed doctors at the clinic, they're like, well, just look, no, if you're ever crazy, why don't you come in? We'll give you a prescription for some doctor. And I'm just like, you know, I'm like, uh, you know, uh, you gonna care for me in your living room when my wife kicks me out of the house, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, and so I shared with this doctor, like, how all of these, my history, right? And the doctor had a new way of looking at it because they only know what medicine's giving to them at school, right? And medicine and these pharmaceutical companies are saying, well, yeah, if they're on Suboxone, they're taking this regularly, they may not die out there from fentanyl. 
which may or may not be true. It may give them enough. But the thing is, is like with the allergy and the craving, right? The obsession of the mind. When we're on harm reduction medication, we are subjective to the, you know, that obsession of the mind. We've got that substance in the body, which is going to continue that craving. And so I think um, not being reformers, if people are not willing to work to get off of harm reduction medication, we don't have anything to offer them here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, they may be in here for alcohol. They may, you know, the judge may be sending them to Alcoholics Anonymous because, you know, alcoholic alcohol was part of their toxicology report. And they may very well be an alcoholic somewhere in there. Um, I'm very careful with this. I'm very careful with what I do with these people. And I may ask them to do more things uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I may require them to get into a service position quicker. I'm not going to coddle them. Um, you know, and we may ask a little more of them up front to see if, you know, just to make sure, because we're not reformers. So if you're, you know, if this is not something that you is sounding good to you and that you want to do, um, you know, I'm sorry. I feel sorry for you because I understand that you have to get that signature so they don't put you back in jail. So, I mean, I'm, I just I just want to bring up this third category because we've only talked about the two categories. And I, I love that writing it down idea. You know, it's great to keep track. The amount of pain medication I was on for exploded disc, I wasn't writing nothing. But, but, um, but I, you know, I think that that's, that kind of idea is, is useful. So, but let's not mix the mental health medications and the post-surgery, the recovery medications up from the supplemental um, medications. Okay. We are actually running out of time. So, um, uh, I'm going to wrap us up here <clears throat> with the uh, with the responsibility statement that we're going to all say together. Okay, I am I responsible, am responsible when, when anyone, anyone anywhere anywhere reaches, reaches out, for out for help. I want the hand of AA always to be there, for and that, for that, I am responsible. I am responsible. Thank you, everybody. Um, if anyone has a suggestion for a topic. Uh, a potential topic for a sponsor um, sponsorship workshop, go ahead and shoot me an email at thirdlegacy at seattleaa.org. If there's something that you would like to, to hear or something you want to speak on or, or anything like that. And I would love to, I'd love to hear about that. Arn, um, and um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, especially to the panel for being willing to, uh, being willing to share. I really appreciate you guys doing that.